What's up, my bitter bros? Beauty Maniac here with week three NFL power rankings, or at least my power rankings, I should say. Three things to know, three things I want to get through first before we start. This will be in a playlist of every week, so if you are tuning into this and this is like a later, if it's like week 15 now when you tune into this, check out the playlist, see how teams stack up, see how they moved up and down throughout the year, and I will try to give, do my best to give reasons why they're moving up and down. Also, there's a video I'm uploading currently as I'm recording this about the quarterback situation in the NFL right now, and that was before... The Daniel, I recorded that before Daniel Jones officially got named a starter for the Giants. Just so that's a side note. Also, for the third thing, um, I'm going to do this video a little differently. I want to start out at number one and go down. Just because it's easier to explain it that way. Or at least for me, it's easier to explain it that way. And it's less of a mystery right now who's up top compared to who's at bottom. If this is how you guys prefer, let me know in the comment section down below. I usually go from 32 to 1, but if you guys prefer 1 through 32 or 32 through 1, just let me know for future reference. Okay, at number 1, we have the New England Patriots moving up two spots. Now, I've said this before in the last couple weeks, or at least I believe I said it. If not, I haven't said it. I have thought it. The top three teams right now are extremely fluid you could realistically move any of these three up and down, which is kind of what happened this week. New England has outscored their opponents 76-3. to They haven't faced the toughest opponents, of course, with Pittsburgh currently being 0-2, Miami currently being 0-2, stuff like that. But one thing that leads me to move New England above Kansas City in L.A. is the fact that their defense got two pick-six touchdowns, which is something that they haven't done in a long time. Stephon Gilmore, I believe that was his first defensive touchdown of his career. Jimmy Collins had two interceptions. Chase Winovich had a sack and a half. Major weak point right now for the Patriots is their offensive line. I always try to point out a negative, especially for these top teams. Um, their offensive line with Isaiah Wynn being week to week with turf toe. I don't know how long Marcus Cannon's going to be outside. Newhouse did not look good, so they brought in Beninich, I believe is his name, Chase Beninich or whatever, on the offensive line to help out with their depth. Tom Brady looks really solid. They got Antonio Brown adjusted into the lineup, but I'm not sure how much longer he'll be playing. On he, Of course, he could be suspended. That's That would be sad. Well, that wouldn't be, I wouldn't care because if he got suspended, he deserves it. But with Josh Gordon and Julian Edelman, they saw a decrease in targets, which I believe if Antonio Brown would be suspended would just go back up to how it was in week one. You got Benjamin Watson coming back in a couple weeks as well. And th this week they're going up against the New York Jets, who just lost their second string quarterback and benched their b highest paid cornerback. And their offensive line doesn't look that much better. Uh, very interesting situation. I honestly think these top three teams are 1A, 1B, 1C. You have Kansas City at number two. I have Kansas City at number two for one particular reason, and that's more so the defense. I still don't trust that defense fully. Their defense looks really good, but I don't trust it fully. I give the edge to the Patriots to where they have the much better defense. But the Chiefs' offense is legit. One of the best offenses in the league, if not the best, with one of the best young quarterbacks in the league, if not the best. Because I don't want to make assumptions, because week to week anything can happen. But right now, Kansas City's number two. I like McCole Hardman. I like, I, I love Patrick Mahomes, honestly. Kelsey, really great, really great tight end. One thing that makes me nervous about the Kansas City Chiefs moving forward is is the injury to LaShawn McCoy. I'm aware it's probably not that serious, but to lose a back who instantly contributed to the offense like that when you're already missing Tyreek Hill, I don't want to say it limits the offense because they got a lot of talent, but it limits the amount of weapons. And sometimes if you're facing an elite defense like what New England looks like or like, for example, Dallas. Dallas looks really good. Something like that. It could something could happen. But they're number two. The their one B right now is where they are. Then you have the Los Angeles Rams moving down two spots to one C. I don't one C, which is actually three. Uh, one reason I moved them down 
for the sake of anything, is not anything due to them. It's more so Kansas City and New England outperforming Los Angeles. I think Los Angeles, their defense has played really well. Their offense has played really well. In fact, I think Jared Goff performed a lot better in Week 2 than he did in Week 1. They do have the benefit of losing Drew Brees on the op- opposing sideline last week and playing against Teddy Bridgewater, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna berate them for that. One major concern for me for LA is the Higby situation, the tight end position. He's not like one of the elite tight ends in the league, but he's a very extremely solid. He's an extremely solid tight end for that offense, especially how they run it. He can block, he can receive. He's one of the better blocking tight ends in the league that can also threaten you in the pass game. If he's out for a significant amount of time, this could hurt the team. Injuries are usually the biggest concern for most teams. Then you have Dallas at number four, moving up one spot as well. Dallas, one of the best teams in the league, probably a Super Bowl contender. Like, if you look at the top four and said New England, Kansas City, L.A., Dallas, and the conference championships, he probably wouldn't blink an eye. I like how Dak Prescott has performed so far. And they go up against Miami this week, which should be embarrassing. Uh, one, one big problem for the Cowboys going into the future, not minus, minus the obvious Dolphins game that should be a blowout again, is, I believe his name is Xavier Woods. The safety is out for, I believe they said, six to eight weeks. Or at least someone, I'm not sure if it was Schefter or someone else, said six to eight weeks with a high ankle sprain. Honestly, though, if I'm the Dallas Cowboys, if he's going to get injured, this is the part of the schedule where you can realistically look like, okay, let's not rush him back. Let him sit out eight weeks, get completely healthy, because we don't have to force him back. We have a good secondary, we have good defense. And we face teams like the Dolphins and stuff like that, so where we do have some tough opponents, at worst, we'll most likely go 6-2 and two in that stretch, which would push him to 8-2, and two, which would be great. If you push him back too early and he gets hurt seriously for the tougher stretch in the playoffs, that could be much more devastating. Other than that, I love the Cowboys offense, and I love how Jason, Jason Witten has gotten involved. And then you got Baltimore at number five, moving up two spots. Baltimore is now in the top five category. I will say that for sure. Their opponents haven't really been that great. <laughs> I mean, they got the Dolphins, who are absolutely terrible, and they got the Cardinals, whose defense is pretty bad. Lamar Jackson, you can't really ask much more out of a young quarterback. And one thing I will say about the Baltimore Ravens, and one thing that irritates me on Twitter, on ESPN, stuff like that, how Lamar Jackson mocks everyone who called him a running quarterback. Look at his fucking statistics from last year. They're judging you based on what you did. Like, they have fucking statistical evidence that you fucking sucked last year. Your completion percentage, I believe, was ranked 33rd. You were awful last year at throwing Lamar Jackson. Shut the fuck up. Sit the fuck down. You like you can mock them all you want. Like, oh, I'm a running back. <laughs> that's because that's all you did last year. All you did last year was really run the ball. And when people stopped you, you lost. But now, you're a great thrower. You improved. You grew. And that's what being in the NFL is about. You gotta grow. You gotta play to your strengths. Improve your weaknesses. Stuff like that. Lamar Jackson, last year, his weaknesses was throwing. But now he's fucking incredible. Andrews at tight end is a great addition for this Baltimore Ravens offense. He's showing up in a way I never thought really a tight end for the Baltimore Ravens would. And he's becoming quite a reliable option for Lamar Jackson. And that's really what I think a young quarterback needs is a nice, reliable tight end. Like Jimmy Garoppolo has in San Fran. And Hollywood Brown, I believe, had 8 catches for 84 yards. So he has 12 catches for like 200-something yards already this year. That is absolutely incredible. I would have preferred Mark Ingram to get more action in the last game over Lamar Jackson rushing the ball for so much just because I believe Mark Ingram getting rushing attempts and stuff like that would keep Lamar fresher, especially with all the injuries to quarterbacks lately. Major concern for me for the Ravens going forward would definitely have to be their offensive line. Um, It's not really a huge concern. It's just... Lamar Jackson relies on his legs a lot. And if you run up against a team that sets the edge and doesn't allow him to run so much and doesn't allow the run game to get off and he has to, has to absolutely throw to win, 
how will he respond? That that's not so much like, oh my god, that's they're gonna lose if that happens. I just want to see what he does in return. There's a lot of quarterbacks in this league that they've had to throw to win. I mean, look at Pat Mahomes against the Los Angeles Rams last year. Did he win? No, but he had to throw to win, and he put up 50 damn points. Brady's had to throw to win before. Drew Brees has had to throw to win a lot in his career. When Lamar Jackson has to throw to win against a team better than Arizona, better than Miami, how will that how will that go through? And that's what I love about the NFL. Then you got Green Bay at number six, moving up four spots. Their defense is, I think, legit. They faced a terrible Chicago offense and a terrible Kirk Cousins. So there's nothing really proven that they're goddamn amazing. But they are, to me, really good. One thing they struggled with last week is their run defense. So I want to, that's probably my major concern going forward is how they solidify that. You got Aaron Rodgers and LaFleur. LaFleur yelling at each other, but I honestly I think that's what a young relationship like that needs. You know, kind of that bickering that young couples have sometimes. Still, I think it's healthy. I like how they utilize Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones in the run game, both of them. I like how that offense looks like it's starting to get Devontae Adams the ball more. Aaron Rodgers is starting to look better and better the more time, more he plays in that system, which is also very good. Then you have Houston at number 7, moving up 6 spots because they were 13 last week. After a tough loss to the Saints, they beat the Jacksonville Jaguars due to a failed two-point conversion. I struggled putting Houston up this high at number seven, but I like looking at the individual matchups over the last couple of weeks, they faced a tough Drew Brees team and lost because they left Drew Brees too much time. And then they faced a tough Jacksonville defense that got carved up by Mahomes. But Deshaun Watson, we know, isn't Mahomes. But they still came out with victory. Major concern for the Texans at number 7 is I do feel like this might be a little bit too high. But as we go down around here, it starts to get a lot more muddled. And it's really hard to distinguish one team over another because they each have their weakness. The weakness for me, for the Texans, would have to be their... their it would have to be their mid game their midfield game like they can run the ball they can short pass they can deep pass but and defensively how they cover the medium routes i i just want to see them go up against someone who carves up the middle like maybe mahomes and see how that defense can handle it i'm not sure if those linebackers can cover some of the better slot receivers in the league or if their dbs are going to be that reliable that offensive line also isn't that or eight, but Deshaun Watson is playing pretty well. The Andre Hopkins didn't play that well, but they still got the win. Then you got Seattle at number eight, moving up three spots. They played really well, got the win over Pittsburgh, over a bad Pittsburgh team that lost its starting quarterback. So I did struggle putting Seattle up this high, but they are two and zero. No, we'll give them credit for that. Russell Wilson looks really good, so I will give him credit for that as well. And overall, that run game looks really good. Penny, Carson, they look really good. DJ, DK Metcalf looked really, really good in his game. This team, to a lot of people, might not be a top 10 team in the league. But the, their rate of improvement from preseason to week one to week two is extremely good. Their defense, once Ansa gets healthy, you're going to have Ansa, Reed, Javen Clowney on that defensive line. Their secondary may not be the strongest, but if you have a pass rush that good, you you the quarterback's not gonna have that much to throw. Whereas opposed to someone, let's say a team with a weak pass rush, like Jacksonville, who hasn't had a lot of success with the pass rush, it weakens the secondary because they have to cover for longer. So I think Seattle does belong in the top ten for now. Then you have New Orleans at number nine, dropping five spots. Now one thing I will say is. Unless a team is trending down beforehand, I'm not going to drop them, let's say, 13 spots, 14 spots, stuff like that. Because that just leads oh, leads to too much like drastic movement. Yes, New Orleans did lose Drew Brees for about six weeks or so, depending on what the second opinion says. But with Drew Brees being lost, 
They get Teddy Bridgewater, who is a solid replacement. They still have Alvin Kamara and Michael Thomas on that offense. They still have Latavius Murray, who should see, honestly, more action with the loss of Drew Brees. That defense does look pretty solid, although they did struggle against the Los Angeles Rams. And honestly, overall, I still feel like they're one of the most talented rosters in the NFL. Minus Drew Brees, if they can, let's say, go 3-3 three and three in the stretch that Drew Brees goes out, they should be in good position to make the playoffs. If they go something like 1-5, and five, even 2-4, and four, it could be a little bit too much for them to overcome. So for now, they're on the downward slope. I still have them top 10, but it's, it's all tricky. It's a very tricky situation when someone loses their starting quarterback. And at number 10, we have the Minnesota Vikings, who have the most overpaid quarterback in the league in Kirk Cousins, who won with only 10 pass attempts, and then when asked to throw the ball to win the game, he was fucking awful. Kirk Cousins sucks. There is not much else to say. Kirk Cousins is that quarterback that you're thinking about on fantasy. Like, if you're drafting a fantasy team, Kirk Cousins is that guy where you're like, oh, I can wait until the seventh round to get him. And then once the seventh round comes around, you're like, God, I, I could use another backup wide receiver. I could use another backup running back. And you see Kirk Cousins on the board, and you're like, I'm going to wait another round. And then you wait another round, and wait another round, and wait another round. Because although he looks good, and he sounds good, you know he ain't going to be good. And Dalvin Cook, although he's amazing in the run game so far, if Kirk Cousins can't step up, this Minnesota Vikings team is not going to make it far in the playoffs whatsoever. Kirk Cousins sucks and then you have Chicago at number 11 moving up spot with their game winning field goal I guess you say one reason why Chicago moves up over really anybody else and it's not because of Mitch Trubisky although he did play a little bit better Montgomery played a little bit better Trey Burton it was nice seeing him in the game but their defense their defense is absolutely incredible yes they won against Joe Flacco in the Denver Broncos offense but that does not change the fact that Mac. And that defensive line looks extremely, extremely intimidating. And they're coming off of two amazing games where they allowed a total of, I think, like 23 points, something like that. Because they won, I think they won like 15-13, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. I think I'm wrong there, but I think they surrendered only 23 points. So that defense is legit, it's just that offense needs to step up. And you have Philadelphia at number 12, dropping six spots. I'm I'm plummeting down Philadelphia right now. One reason is, one, one thing I value more so than anything else, and I say this a lot, for, even last year when I did this, and if you are familiar with me, it's consistency. I don't care if you're consistently middle class or consistently mediocre or whatever you want to call it. I would take that over being great one quarter, Absolutely terrible one quarter. Great one quarter. Absolutely fucking terrible one quarter. If you look at their game against Washington, they won. But they played like dog shit in the first half. Played good in the second half and won. But it's against the Washington Redskins, which don't pose that much of a threat. At least, not in my opinion. Sorry, Washington. And then they played against Atlanta, who played like dog shit against Minnesota. And they ended up playing like dog shit and ended up losing that game. I believe Deshaun Jackson went down, so... I'm not going to blame this one on Wentz, but it's they've been playing very inconsistently. They're a good team. They have a good roster, great defense talent-wise, great offense, great offense talent-wise, but they're not consistently putting it together, and that irritates the fuck out of me. And yes, I will put a team like New Orleans with questionable quarterback situations. Yes, like Minnesota with an absolutely terrible quarterback and Kirk Cousins, who honestly is probably average, not terrible. I just like to berate him a little bit. And then Chicago with another mediocre quarterback. I would put them over Philly, who has a solid quarterback, because of the inconsistencies that Philly has more so than anyone else. I could look at Philly any given week, and at this point, I don't know what I'm going to get. And that's not good with the NFL, because this isn't like a, oh, you don't know if they're going to run the ball, pass the ball, and beat your ass. It's... I don't know going into the next week if Philadelphia is gonna lay an egg and get their ass beat, or if they're gonna make, or if they're gonna like just punch the fuck out of the other team. It's, it's just extremely irritating. And you have the Chargers moving down four spots. They lost to the goddamn Detroit Lions. Their kicker, who was reliable last week, the punter kicker, was terrible this week. Awful. They lost on kicks. 
Uh, so I knock him down a little. But with that offense against a defense like the Detroit Lions, who is good. I will mind you, Detroit Lions defense is good. But that offense should have managed more points than that to beat the Lions. The Lions did not score a lot. And they still won. So I'm going to put that on the Chargers offense. That is supposed to be their strong point, And they failed. Then you got Atlanta at number 14, gaining three spots for beating Philadelphia. Mainly, they might be a little bit higher if they played better in Week 1. Probably one of the better-looking teams in the NFC South. But still, Atlanta, they need to consistently put it together. Devontae Freeman played a little bit better. Julio Jones played better. Ridley played better. Matt Ryan played better. That defense played better. But still, honestly, now this might be a move that no one expects coming but if you look at the four, the Falcons roster, you're, you might think, what's the weak point of the Falcons roster? And if I had to personally point, point out the weak points, I wouldn't say the offense. Their, their line is good enough. Their tight ends, wide receivers, running backs, good enough. I would say the secondary. Now, bold prediction time. What if the Falcons traded for Jalen Ramsey of the Jaguars, offered a first-round pick, and fucking, I don't know, Edo Smith... Or someone like Sanu, something like that. I wouldn't trade Sanu if I was the Falcons, but someone like that, one of the, like, the third string or something. I think that would be very interesting, and that would change the face of the NFC a little bit. I mean, it wouldn't put the Falcons at the top, but it would make the Falcons a contender. At number 15, we have Indianapolis moving up three spots into the top half of the league after a good win over a Titans team in their division. Now, divisional matchups are hard to rate for me. They have always been hard to rate for me. But still, I will rate this one. Uh, Jacoby Brissett played well. Venetari played awful again. So the win should have been bigger than it was. Venetari was kind of cryptic after the game. Almost sounded like he was going to retire. Which, you don't want to see someone going out like that. If someone goes out, you want to see it like Gronkowski. Where he played, had that amazing catch in the Super Bowl and retired. Or like... Peyton Manning, where he won the Super Bowl and retired, stuff like that. You kind of want to have those kind of moments. You don't want to have this moment where you miss, like, five kicks in two weeks and just leave. But still, I like the defense of Indy. They played really well. That offensive line has played really well. Marlon Mack has played really well and has let Jacoby Brissett really do what he has. And I'm not sure of his name, but that rookie receiver of the Colts, I think, has stepped up quite a bit. And it's helped Jacoby Brissett move along faster than probably most thought he would at this point. Is he putting up 400 yards a game? No, but Jacoby Brissett's doing what it takes to win. And Alex Smith made the postseason quite a bit being just a game manager. So if Jacoby Brissett can be a game manager who can throw, then I think that's all the Colts really need, and they could make a serious push in the playoffs. And they have Tennessee at number 16, dropping two spots with a loss to the Colts, a tough loss indeed. This... Quarterback situation for the Titans is confusing. Mariota, I want to like him. He has a lot of fucking talent. But just like the Philadelphia Eagles, he's so freaking inconsistent. Delaney Walker, one of the best tight ends in the league. This team should be better than it is. This defense should be better than it is. You got Malcolm Butler, Logan Ryan, and Biard on that defensive backfield. So this defense should be really good, but they just... They just don't consistently put it together. And just like with the Eagles, if you're not consistent, then fuck you because I hate inconsistent teams. Just like the Patriots early last year. I hate inconsistent teams. That's why they're in like my bottom half almost. Okay, second half, number 17. I just wanted to um, stop the recording for a little bit, get a drink of water, rest my throat, stuff like that. And I wanted to check to see how long the recording is so far, and it's about 23 minutes. So I'm going to try to get this thing under 40 minutes, which is going to be hard, but this is going to take like 10 hours to upload, so I apologize. Anyway, we got Buffalo at number 17, moving up two spots. I like how Jared Allen plays. I like how he's run the ball. I like John Brown at the receiving core. Cole Beasley, I wish he would step up a little bit more. And I I honestly like the, the one-two punch of Singletary and Gore, although I believe Singletary should be the featured back at this point. Gore. Played really well in the last game. Their defense is stepping it up a little bit. Defensive offensive, offensive line looks a lot better than I thought it would. Yes, they've played against the New York Giants and the New York Jets, who aren't obviously the greatest teams in the league. So, to me, I don't. Want, it's more of a hesitant push for Buffalo, although I believe they're on the rise when they face a better team and dominate like they have the last couple of weeks. 
Oh, well, they didn't dominate the Jets in the first half. When, if they dominate the better teams like they did the Giants, they're definitely going to be on their way up. And fuck, they they made Eli look so bad that Daniel Jones is now starting. And you have Cleveland at number 18 moving up three spots. I'm not going to say Cleveland redeemed themselves with a 23-3 victory. They played against the Jets, whose secondary got toasted worse than a marshmallow at a, camp, at a campground. And their offense didn't look that good at times either, which is against a Jets defense like that. That's kind of not that. That's not ideal. The Cleveland defense went up against basically Luke Falk. <laughs> Luke Falk. A quarterback I never thought I would say would be starting a game right now. Although he didn't play that bad, I'm going to be a little bit more hesitant when it comes to Cleveland, especially after the goose egg they laid in week one. Then you have San Fran moving up seven spots. Now, this is why they're up here. They are the biggest gainer of the week. San Fran moving up to 19 after a really, really solid win over Cincinnati, who actually had Cincinnati win this one. Now, it's not just the fact that since uh, San Fran won, because obviously Cincinnati doesn't really look that good at all. Their defense doesn't look good at all. It's more so the fact that San Fran looks solid. Brita looks really good at running back. Obviously, the offense looks good when, and the other wide receivers look better than I thought. Garoppolo looks really good. Most start one of the running backs of San Fran, could be a borderline pickup in fantasy. He looked really, really good, so... That offense has multiple weapons, and that defense obviously has Richard Sherman leading the way. I still wish he would unblock me on Twitter just because he got mad that I trolled him after the Seahawks lost the Super Bowl, and he blocked me. Yeah. Anyway, I like what San Fran's going. They're still bottom half of the league for me, but they're trending up. They are 2-0. and They're one of the lowest-rated 2-0 and teams to me, but they put them up against some solid competition, like when they face the Rams, when they face the Seahawks, and that'll be a better test to see where they are. But until now, 19. The number 20, we have the Carolina Panthers dropping four spots after a very, very tough loss that they honestly should have won. Tampa Bay, Thursday Night Football, they lost to Tampa Bay. I'm not going to criticize them more than that. McCaffrey looked fucking awful. Like, I don't know if it was game plan or what the fuck it was. But Cam Newton can't zing a ball. He He's like a fucking Zippo lighter that's almost out of flu, fluid. Lighter fluid in it. Um, McCaffrey played terrible. He f- fucked my fantasy team. But no no critics to him. He got way overused in week one. In that loss. They're 0-2. Their defense needs to get it together. Although they perform better against Tampa Bay. It's fucking Tampa Bay. A team that... I just, they lost to Tampa Bay. I need to see something out of Carolina before I put them up in the top half again. And you got Detroit at number 21 moving up four spots. They did beat the Los Angeles Chargers. But there's still a lot of question marks at least how this Detroit team is going to perform. They do struggle with consistency. But in the bottom half, that's not so much more of a factor than if you're in the top half of the league. And to me, Detroit's still in the bottom half. I love how Galladay looked. I love how Kerryon Johnson looked. Matthew Stafford looked a lot better. Daniel, Daniel Mandola wasn't relied upon as heavily as he was in Week 1. I think that benefited the Lions. Their defense also looked really solid. So they're on the upswing, but it would be interesting to see how they handle d- defenses like the Packers, like the Vikings, like the Bears when they face them in division. And you got Oakland at number 22. They didn't move. Oakland didn't move. They lost by 18 points, but they didn't move. One reason is, although it, they were kind of inconsistent in that game, they went up 10-0 on the Kansas City Chiefs. And then the second quarter happened. If you look at that game and you take out the second quarter, the Raiders won 10 nothing. if you take out the second quarter. Now, we've seen dominant second quarters before. Tom Brady has thrown, I believe, five touchdown passes in one quarter before. I believe it was against the Bills in 2010, something like that. But Oakland lost. Josh Jacobs looked Okay, Waller didn't have a great game, but they started well, ended poorly, and like I said, you take out that second quarter, they beat the Chiefs 10-0, that second quarter was awful, but that defense performed better in the second half of the game after the second quarter, so although I there is reason to drop the Raiders or reason to move the Raiders up, 
I'm going to keep them still for now until I see a little bit more consistency. And then, at number 23, you have the Pittsburgh Steelers dropping eight spots. That's why they're here. I think this is the first time, I might be mistaken, that I've had a team drop 16 spots in just two weeks. Especially to open the season, because that's not really ideal in anybody's situation. Um... Mason Rudolph's in. Big Ben's out for the year. That's going to be an interesting issue to see. James Conner has not put a good game together yet in the first two weeks. The first week he got butt spanked in New England. Then the second week he got hurt. And it's really concerning. Now, I did put these ratings out before the news of Minka Fitzpatrick being traded to the Steelers. So, I'm not going to change it now off of speculation. I want to see how he performs in the system first. The defensive play calling has been kind of bad. Kind of bad, but they were in position to win against the Seahawks, which is a lot better than how they performed in week one. So they are, although they lost eight spots, they are on the upswing, which is good. If they would have got spanked by the Seahawks, they probably would be 27th or lower. I am very unforgiving, especially when it comes to injury. I want to see how Mason Rudolph performs as his first full game as a starter. They do have a couple interesting weeks coming up. Then you have Jacksonville at number 24. Gardner couldn't do it. And this isn't a knock on Gardner. They dropped four spots. This is a knock on Doug Marone because he's a fucking idiot. You are down by one. You have just scored a touchdown. And you're playing against the Houston Texans. And you have one of the best defensive units talent-wise in the league. What do you do? You go for fucking two. And what do you do when you go for two? You don't make a nice pass play between... Shark and Menchu, you don't make a nice pass play between Shark and Didi. You don't make a nice pass play at all. You fucking run Leonard Fournette up the gut in one of the most obvious fucking play calls I have ever seen in my fucking life. Trust the rookie. The rookie got you that far. The rookie almost brought you back in week one. What are you doing? You lost the game because either you were too chicken shit to kick the extra point and go to overtime... Which an overtime loss would have been a much better fucking situation than risking it on a two. A Valenter for out of the middle. One of the most overrated running backs in the goddamn league. A guy who in the first couple of weeks of the league or in the first fucking couple of weeks of his career in the goddamn preseason thought, Oh my god, the NFL is so fucking easy. I'm going to rule this bitch because it was fucking preseason. But guess what? Eat some humble pie, Leonard Fournette. You fucking suck. If you don't have an elite offense with a really good quarterback because... Mind you, when he was really good in the NFL, Blake Bortles played really well. And then Blake Bortles went Blake Bortles, and Leonard Fournette went fucking downhill. So Leonard Fournette, eat some humble pie, eat a dick, suck some ass cheeks, whatever the fuck you want to do. You're not that good, and you cost your team the game. Doug Marone, you're a fucking idiot, and now Jalen Ramsey wants out of town. If this team trades Jalen Ramsey by the end of the year... What message is that going to send to AJ Bouye, AJ Bouye or Miles Jack? What message is that going to send to them? Because Jalen Ramsey, one reason why he was so frustrated with the Jacksonville Jaguars, I don't know if you guys watched the game or if you know about this, but Jalen Ramsey was covering DeAndre Hopkins, and there was a catch called a catch. And Jalen Ramsey's like, Coach, that's not that was not a catch. He did not catch that ball. I want you to challenge that. And if you're a coach, you gotta trust your damn players. If they say something and they say they know it's not a catch, if they're an all pro captain and they say that wasn't a catch, you fucking throw the challenge flag. What they do? They didn't throw the challenge flag. And what was it? That was not a catch, which if they challenged it, it would have completely been overturned. And that could have changed the game. And then they lost on a fucking bullshit play call by Doug Marone. Jalen Ramsey has every right to be pissed. He has every right to want out of town. This situation isn't like Miami. The Jacksonville Jaguars have a much better roster. But their coach, to me, is much worse than in Miami. At least with Brian Flores, he is trying with what he has. He has nothing. He is trying to make a five-star meal on a fucking alley trash can. While Doug Marone is turning... Gourmet lobster and crab into fucking McDonald's style fucking mac and cheese. So, honestly, Doug Marone gets fired. If they replaced him with, let's say, if Tomlin gets fired in Pittsburgh, if they replace Tomlin and put him in Jacksonville, holy hell, I think that would help balance the team back up. Anyway, enough of that. 
And you have Denver at number 25, dropping one spot. Joe Flacco it does not look good. Um, I don't want to say, hey, trade for Eli Manning or whatever, because that, that whole offense doesn't really look that good right now. Emmanuel Sanders had some great plays, I will say that. One thing that's keeping the Denver Broncos this high up is that defensive line, which looks incredible. And then you have the Arizona Cardinals at number 26, gaining three spots. I will move. I'll keep them here for now. Kyler Murray looked re- has looked really good in his first couple of weeks. Larry Fitzgerald has looked good. That David Johnson has looked really good. That defense has not looked good whatsoever. This isn't saying they are great. This is more so saying the teams below them suck that much. At number 27, one of the teams that the Arizona Cardinals have passed is the New York Giants. One reason being that Daniel Jones is starting now, so this team could go up. But that offensive line looks awful. If you have Saquon Barkley bust off a long-ass touchdown touchdown run to start the game, and you absolutely shit the bed against the Buffalo Bills after that, like, I'm I'm not dissing the Buffalo Bills. Obviously, they were my number 17th team. But if your defense plays like that, against Josh Allen and his limited weapons, because obviously the Bills receivers aren't elite elite. They're good, but they're not elite. If your defense can't play well against them, what the fuck are you going to do when you face Dallas, when you face Pitt, when you face New England, when you face Green Bay, when you face better teams? Nothing's going to happen because you suck. That defense is fucking awful. And you have Washington at number 28 moving up two spots after a nice loss. Now, that's odd to say, a nice loss, but they did perform well against Dallas. They did go out to an early lead, so I will give them that, but still, Keenum needs to put together a solid game. Guys, that injury hurts. It looked like it hurt. Adrian Peterson moved past Jim Brown for, I believe, fifth place on the all-time rushing touchdown list, but still, that offense looks very limited. I like how McLaurin, I believe is his name, and I like how he looks, a young rookie for the re- rookie receiver for the Redskins. That defense, obviously very inconsistent as well. Vernon Davis, I think he had an eye injury in the middle of the game, and with Jordan Reed out to a concussion, that's a huge concern going forward. Washington is one of those bottom teams where they play well. They, they're decently consistent but they can never ever finish games and if you can't finish you belong at the bottom i'm sorry then you have the new york jets at number 29 dropping six spots one of the biggest losers of the week why sam donald has mono your backup quarterback simeon looked like he broke his goddamn ankle then you put make levy on bell after a year off rush the ball 31 times in one game I don't know if he rushed for 31 times or if he touched the ball 31 times, but still, you're asking your person, one of your players, to have on pace, I should say, for like 496 touches. That is too much. Even if you had a year off, that is too much. Your offensive line looks bad, booty. Your defense looks so bad that when you. Well, C.J. Mosley is hurt, and Quinn Williams is hurt, so hopefully they have a speedy recovery. That when you bench your $72 million corner, you actually play better. What the fuck? Adam Gase is awful as well. I like, I want to like Lou Falk, but I need to see this team be fucking consistent, because not only is this team awful, they're awful and inconsistent all at the same time. They only scored three points against the Browns after a nice drive by Luke Falk and... I believe it was after the Simeon injury. But they lost the Bills after having a 16 to nothing lead. Come on. Then you have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 30 with a good win over Carolina. After the goose egg, Tampa Bay laid in week one. And their running back room is looking a little bit more balanced with Peyton Barber looking to be the featured back now. O.J. Howard is non-existent in that offense. Cameron Bray is almost non-existent in that offense. It's just a horrible situation. Godwin looks really good. Jameis Winston looks bad at the same time, which is odd. That defense does not look really good either. This team is a team that could move up easily, but I don't think they will. I think the Buccaneers will finish as a bottom five team in the NFL. No offense to Buccaneers fans. And you have the the Cincinnati Bengals at number 31, dropping three spots. Uh, they lost back-to-back games. They were contenders for a little bit in this game. They got blown off. Their doors got blown off against San Fran. 
Andy Dalton looked decent. Boyd and Ross and Eifert, although I believe Eifert only had three catches for nine yards, they all looked solid in that offense. That offensive line is awful. That linebacking core is the worst linebacking core in the NFL and the worst linebacking core I have seen in a long time. And yes, I point out weaknesses for every team that I've mentioned so far, but when you can take your starting linebacking core and be like, hey, hey, would these guys start on any other team in the NFL? And if you can say none of those linebackers would start for any of the other 31 teams in the NFL, you got a big fucking issue because your linebacking core is going to control a lot of what that def defense does. If your linebacking core cannot help in the run game, you're fucked. If your linebacking core can't help in coverage when you need it, you're fucked. And it's going to make, when you play zone, or even if you play man, really fucking hard to do. Because there's always going to be someone open. And that's the current situation that Cincinnati faces. Their offensive line and their linebacking core are all awful. And they're both some of the most vital units you can have on both offense and defense. And then, at number 35... You have the Miami Dolphins, number 35. Now, I'll preface this by saying, what do you mean, what, 35? There's only 32 teams, so what's 32, 33, 34? Well, that would be Alabama, Clemson, and Oklahoma. Those would be 32, 33, 34 compared to Miami. Miami is that bad. Obviously, it's a joke. I'm not going to com really compare college teams to any NFL teams, but... When you have Fitzpatrick as your starting cornerback, quarterback and you refuse to switch to Rosen, granted, I'm happy they don't name Rosen the starter because that offensive line is so goddamn bad you would destroy a kid if you put him under there. But at the same time, what are you doing, Miami, putting Rosen in after you are 30 points behind in both games? What the fuck? You threw two pick sixes. One to Stephon Gilmore, which was one of the easiest picks of his life. All he had to do was break on that route, and there was no one in front of him. And then Jamie Collins, who got a deflection off of the running back's hands for an interception, who <laughs> no one on Miami caught up to him, and he wasn't even running at full speed. The only person who was close to him, who was chasing him, was an offensive lineman who was out there playing for his goddamn career now you might not notice this but look at that play look at that jamie collins play where he gets that deflection for the interception he runs it in for the touchdown and you look at that offensive lineman running after him tripping up and jamie collins waltz in and dante hightower is kind of following him with a block but look at that offensive lineman he is the only goddamn person on that whole Miami offense who's fucking trying to take down Jamie Collins. If you look at me and you say you have Kenyon Drake, you have Kenyon Kalen Blage, you have fucking Jakeem Grant or whoever the fuck on the offense as wide receivers and you're telling me none of them none of them chased Jamie Collins for the 60 yard touchdown. I don't care if you were 5-10 yards behind. The offensive lineman for fuck's sakes was trying 100% better than any of you fucks. And do you know why he was trying? Because he knows that offensive line is bad. He knows that offense and that whole fucking team is bad. But he also knows that if he ever wants a shot in the NFL after this terrible team, he's going to have to show heart. And honestly, I fucking love that dude. I don't even know his name. In fact, I'm going to look at that play after this video. And I'm going to look up that guy. And I'm going to fucking follow him on Twitter and whatever because that guy... And that one play showed more heart than that whole entire offense or defense did in that whole game for the Miami Dolphins. Minus Howard on that defense and Minka, who's not being properly used, who isn't even a Dolphin anymore. So there's that. Fuck you, Miami. Fuck you. You're just, you don't belong in the NFL. If this was like some of those European soccer leagues where you can literally get kicked out of the Premier League or whatever and go to a lesser league, that would happen I honestly would not be mad if the NFL developed a minor league system just to throw Miami in the minor leagues and promote another team up. I would not be mad. I would not. And this isn't even on Brian Flores. Yes, at this point, it's a rant. I don't give a shit. If you don't like it, tune out. But this isn't even on Brian Flores. Brian Flores was handed the car to a fucking 1954 beater that has... 600,000 miles on it, and he's trying to drive it to the goddamn store, and it keeps stalling every five seconds. That's what he has. Ownership should be absolutely 
fucking disgusted with what they put on the field. A ownership should be absolutely disgusted that they're asking m fans for money because everyone thinks, oh, the Dolphins are tanking for Tua, the Dolphins are tanking for Tua. Who fucking gives a shit at this point? You may have five first-round picks in the next couple years, but guess what? I don't care if you draft Tua. I don't care if you draft whoever the fuck after that. If you put Tua behind that O-line, behind that offense, with that terrible defense, guess what? Tua's going to get that goddamn Andrew Luck treatment. And we all saw how that worked out. Andrew Luck got sacked with some of the career-high records. We saw Deshaun Watson go through that last year. Record high sack numbers and that will destroy a kid's development that will destroy a kid's heart that will destroy a kid's body And I do not want to put Tua to that Tua does not deserve that if that happens and Dolphins get the number one pick I honestly would prefer Tua to come out with a statement I do not want to be drafted by the Miami Dolphins and I want him to say I fear for my safety for how bad that offensive line is for how bad that team is because any quarterback you put behind there is putting their career at risk. Look at Ryan Fitzpatrick. Look at Josh Rosen. They got beat the fuck by the New England Patriots. Imagine if they faced a, like pass rushers with more force, like a Miles Garrett, like a like a Demarcus Lawrence, stuff like that. Which they're gonna have to face a Demarcus Lawrence this coming week. We could be seeing the last of Ryan Fitzpatrick in a Dolphins uniform. Because he could get fucking destroyed. And I don't want that for Tua. Like, you could be a Dolphins fan and want Tua and more to you. Because obviously you want better players for your team. But you need to fix that team before you bring Tua to that. The quarterback is the least of your worries. Improve that offensive line this year. Improve that defense this year. Fucking get Trevor Lawrence the next year. Something like that. You need to improve that whole team first. Anyway, guys. Hope you have a good time. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.